Um, I have a list of names before we even talk about things. Um, you know, there's a whole hot peaches crowd there. Right. But you want to just look at those names in case you know any of those people, because some of them I don't know if I'm going to be able to easily track down or not. Um, yeah, I do. I know. I know uh, some of them better than others. I know. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I know Tony Fish. Uh, Babs Gray, I haven't seen for a long time, but I know her. Mark Kinney, who was Jimmy's lover, I don't know. Do you know if he was an act up? Probably. Because that was an act up, and I, when I saw that name, Mark Kinney, I thought, I didn't I'm sure he was, name, actually. So, okay. Um, yeah, International Crisis is dead, but yes, that was. Uh, Betty Bourne, who's from the um, Blue Lips group, and probably lives in London, I would think, right now. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know that. um, Michael Lynch, uh, and Julia Dares, I know of, I'm not really... But Jimmy would probably be a guy who would be the best to... Well, he probably has their you'll know numbers where people and stuff are. now, Ron Jones. I, I have, I have like very old numbers, I don't think I have them with me. But, I mean, if you can't find them, call me and I'll... I, I'll I, yeah. I won't bother you otherwise. Because I could probably, it's just been a very long time. I haven't worked with these guys for, you know, yeah. eight years or something. But yeah, I, okay. so I, you know, Jimmy, if Jimmy doesn't have it, I could probably find some of them. Perfect. All right. Yeah, I don't know. I'll see the photo there. I'm not sure. I wonder when this was. Yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of them do have dates and things, and mm -hmm. photos and things, but this one doesn't have anything. But uh, I'm sure when I speak to uh, Jimmy, he'll, he'll have, he would have all the documents. And yeah, he probably will. I mean, again, style. as you're looking, I don't mind. You know, I would. Lo I love to immortalize these. Uh, you know, Marsha and International Crisis. So whenever I can do anything to. Oh, okay. So great. really, call me with anything. Okay. I probably oh. have stuff somewhere, you know, okay. all over the place. Yeah. yeah, and if you ever do come across a person that knew Marsha that you had sort of forgotten about mm -hmm. or, you know, isn't on this hot teachers list, okay, I'll you know, always stuff. let yeah. me know. Okay, um, Ron Jones is a good one too, he's in there, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. okay. Um, uh, your website is great. Did you do that yourself? My husband actually. Wow. Yeah. You Does like you do that it? for a living? He has yeah. a really good yeah. website. Oh, yeah. good, good. That was really good. I uh, I saw that and um, I think the link was uh, Marsha P. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, with the internet you have to continually go back in and do searches because people put websites on. So like three months from now I'll do another search with Marsha's name. Right, and something else will come up. And uh, when I saw that, that was really good. And you feel free to use anything from that uh, like little oh, thing okay. I wrote. Yeah, of course I would, um, I would cite you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would be good. Because yeah. that's really, that story is like the epitome of, of, of my... Marcia? Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm just, I just wrote down some questions, but we can just let it sort of flow. Okay. Before we get into Marsha, I'd just like to get a little bit about your background. I think I read that you're from Brooklyn Heights. Yeah, I'm from Brooklyn Heights, Brooklyn. yeah, okay. and then I grew up uh, in Cobble Hill, okay. and um, kind of from a, um, uh, I guess we call them a, a liberal, you know, Jewish family, and uh, I don't really know how I ever got connected to the pages. I really don't know how it happened. See, that's, I, that's, I thought we would leave there somehow. <laughs> um, uh, well, you say. went to you went to college, so you were SUNY yeah, Purchase. Yeah, I went to SUNY, SUNY Purchase. I went okay. to uh, literature. Literature. Not for performing yeah. arts. No. Okay. no, I've had a really weird, eclectic kind of okay. thing. Um, I think the way that I met, I uh, uh, let's see who I met. I must have met Jimmy Camichi at first through a guy named Yuri Schubert, who um, was my sister's boyfriend. And uh, he was connected somehow with this whole Lower East Side thing, and he knew Jimmy somehow. And then Jimmy s hired me to do some shows that, with the Hot Peaches, and 
And that was 1983, because this was the year 19, you know, from 1983. Yeah, I guess it was. God, yeah. Yeah, probably it was 1983, yeah. And so I think I, the first thing I did with Jimmy was um, something called Waldorf Salad, which was uh, with Undine. Do you know who Undine is? God, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. He's kind of brought back from wherever, <laughs> whatever place he was, and yeah. So it was again. It was like this weird combination of, of people, and then then I started a long term, you know, kind of uh, working relationship with Jimmy, and uh, we went to Europe a few times. And so somewhere along the road, Marsha and um, I met Marsha and uh, International Crisis. Okay. Um, I have a video cassette um, which somebody edited, and it's mm -hmm. basically hot peaches, but all it is is introducing Marsha. Marsha, you know, it, right. it's edited. It, there aren't complete shows. But um, Marsha mentions about being with the hot peaches for the last 14 years. So was Marsha affiliated somehow yeah, I mean, before I, you arrived? Yeah, I think yeah. I think Jimmy had known her from way, you know, way in the the early days, the Stonewall thing. You know, I, I think uh, there's a great uh, one of my favorite things that Jimmy ever wrote was called the uh, uh, Spare Chance, Spare and Change for a Dying Queen, and it's I don't know if it's in that one. It might be. Um, you yes. know, I have a, um, like sort of a cardboard uh, list of different things that Marsha carried, which went out on the stage. Uh huh. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. next to what song? Right. And there's a there is a mention there of something like spare. It might be in this the, the, the uh, thing that I gave you, okay. which I think he wrote about her. So okay. I, I mean, he she she was an inspiration to him as kind of an archetype, which she is, you know, of I don't know what, but she's an archetype of the... I, I actually brought this too because I remember reading. Did you ever see this? Yes, I have that. So, I yeah. mean, I think it's true. She's like the street queen, you know, she was like... But I think he knew her way early on. And off and on, you know, um, she... Uh, he would work with her. I didn't meet her until later on at some point. Okay. I don't so know exactly when. when. You first um, worked with Hot Peaches, Marsha wasn't no, um, in no, that particular show no, or whatever. No, no. Okay. Do you remember the first time you met Marsha? I can't really say I remember the first time. I mean, the, as I said in the thing that I wrote too, it's like Marsha at times was very inconspicuous. I mean, she was always wildly dressed, but so was everybody, so it wasn't a big deal. But she sometimes could be very, you know, quiet and then, you know, all of a sudden, she just go and become. She was pretty crazy. <laughs> I mean, she really was like this. We, I never knew whether she was knew that she was being funny or she was just insane. You know, it was very hard to tell. But she was very. Um, I, you know, you you just can't really put any kind of. Um, there's no way to just to like put her into any kind of particular category. <laughs> yeah, I knew that I knew about I had known that she that Andy Warhol had done a, a Okay, you that was that, one of my right? questions was was that previous to you knowing yes, Marsha? Yes. Okay, because I'm trying to date that. And I contacted the Andy Warhol Museum and they're a mess. I don't know. Are they? they? Yeah, they uh, they're relatively new, and I think they have a ton of things, and they don't. See, I know that Jimmy is going to know, like, you know all this oh, stuff. Okay. He, he right. no, I don't know where he found her, probably on the street somewhere, you know. I mean, that he would pick up from all different areas and places, you know, different characters, and they all kind of converged in this, um, the heat, which when you read that, describes the whole, this, this um, thing is... Um, this play is like the. It might say a lot. It might actually say. I uh, give Dave. It's the his the cr chronology of his working with his truth. You know, so mm -hmm. it might have some. So. Um. Where did you fit in into the group? I have no idea. I, I you know Jimmy always liked the way I sang, and um, I was kind of like um. You know, I wasn't gay. I wasn't um, 
But I was always like the uh, token, you know, diva, like that they threw in okay. there. And uh, and because I had kind of grown up in the that kind of um, you know Lower East Side world, somehow I I had always been affiliated with that world, like the. Um, Theater for the New City and La Mama and stuff. So I kind of just fell in, and I always kind of identified with people on the um, fringes of everything, you know. Mm -hmm. I, you know, so I think that that's where I came in, and um, and you know, I was kind of like I remember International Crisis was always trying to make she. Uh, I was kind of like a, a female drag queen, you know. I mean, uh -huh. in a certain way. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I was like, they were trying to make me more of a, you know, more more into like a drag queen. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, I just, you know, and then I went to Europe with them and I, oh, I, I it was a, kind of a, a very uh, fun time and I never really thought of it as strange or, or weird at all. I mean, it just was, you know, because I had grown up in that kind of whole strange, eclectic world. My brother is a... Um, composer of like new music and you know and all this stuff. I mean it's just like a whole weird, you know, artsy parts kind of time and stuff. So you're just having a good time being yeah. part of it all. Right. You and had I had no master plan that No, I d I don't think I had any master plan. I mean I you know, I grew to love a lot of the you know, especially uh, I think Crisis was the one that I really got the closest to because we traveled through here a lot. But yeah, no, there was no real master plan. Mm -hmm. And I don't think for most of these people there really was a master plan. But they were just doing what they do. Right. Well, you, you mentioned that um, the troupe had gone to uh, England a number of times, but Marsha had not gone. Right. But well, this time she did, so I guess it was sort of like you planned some kind of a, of a, of a tour and people came or didn't right, come. Right, right. Kind of he would, exactly. We actually, uh, I did two, like, European tours with Jimmy, which he has been doing off and on for years. I mean, he hadn't done it for a long time, and when I came in, he had just begun to do them again. I think not until the late 80s did I start doing it. And, um, yeah, it was kind of like he had an idea of who he wanted to come, you know, and the more outrageous the personality, the better. But Marsha was too, uh, you know, even for us. You just, you know, it was just like, she was not going to even pretend or be able to try to conform, as I told in that little piece that I wrote. You know, her idea of conforming was dressing up in this, like, bizarre male drag that completely uh, was obviously not working, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so even Jimmy had to be very careful about, you know, because, uh, so she did not go with us. Crisis went with us for those for the first tour, I think, and then she got sick, so she couldn't come to the, to the next one. But um, you know, she was fine with having. You know, Crisis had to dress up. First of all, Crisis looked like a woman, so you could really, you know. But I mean, Marsha didn't look like a woman. No, Marcia, she was just a, that wasn't Marsha's intention. No, either, no, so. no, no. <laughs> and I never really knew what whether. If Marsha had an, an uh, you know, a conscience, a conscious intention, or it was just, I, I often felt that she was just being what it was that she was, you know, I, you know, she. It's hard to even remember, like, if she ever really, I ever had a real conversation with her. You know what I mean? Oh, really? Because she was just out there, you know. <laughs> She was out there. Yeah, because uh, that was that was um, uh, you know some of the questions that um, that I was going to ask is, is that uh, did you ever talk to Marsha, for example, about her childhood, family? No, I never really did. I I I talked to her. She would say something about where she was living, which I never really got a clear idea that she was wherever the, she ended up in Staten Island. Where was Hope it? Open. Hope Open. Uh, Randy Wicker who owns um, a lighting store on Hudson Street by Christopher. Um, Marsha seemed, and now I haven't, I don't have all the details. Yeah. But seemed to around somewhere around 1980 or 82, somewhere in that area, um, moved in with Randy. Now I don't know whether that was all the time or that was kind of an operating base. 
Yeah, it's very hard to know with what was really happening with her. Most, you know, I had heard they were all had been, you know, prostitutes at some point or another, and um, but she, but she was very involved in. Um, I don't even know which one it was, but some uh, some thing to do with uh, working with like homeless drag queens or, or something. I don't know exactly what it was, but she she had a some kind of thing that she was doing that she was very involved in, like helping the unfortunate. Do you know anything about that? Well, um, previous to your knowing uh, Marsha, uh, and and that's. The title of mine is uh, Star, Street Fence Extra Action right. and Revolutionaries. Um, in the early 70s, around 1971 um, or so, um, Marsha and her friend uh, Sylvia Rivera, I don't know if you know Sylvia, no. okay, um, they created a group called Star, and uh, they created something called Star House. Okay, that's what Where they got a building that they fixed up for street people, mostly right. street prostitutes, to live in sort of a communal um, kind of arrangement. And uh, it lasted for a while, um, but it eventually fell apart because of uh, finances. Right. Um, you think that's what she was? Yes, I think so. Okay, because I'm very interested if you have any memories of what she might have said about that experience. I think it was very meaningful to her, you know? I think that it was very important to her in some way. Um, as I, you know, as I remember Marsha, though, it was really hard to ever get, like, focus. one long, you know, yeah, focus. Because I really think that she was probably psychotic, honestly. I mean, you know, really, I don't, I think she was insane. But... <laughs> Interesting, uh, you, this, maybe you can even give some information here. Um, I've spoken to Marsha's family. I haven't done the formal interviews, but I've talked, and they're very helpful. Really? That's great. Oh, yes, they're very uh, interested in having a whole history of Marsha. Oh, that's great. Um, they tell me that when Marsha was a kid, uh, now, Marsha was always in touch with her family, so it was never a situation that Marsha disappeared right. later on. But as a kid, Marsha never had mental problems. Really? Um, and I've I seen in both um, some interviews and also in videotapes, and also from friends and, and people, saying that she had her breakdown. Um, I don't know when that started, and um, I know she was being treated in New Jersey in a mental health clinic. And, but um, did you have any experience with yeah, what I mean, exactly that was? Yeah, I, as I said, there was a time, and when, especially when we went to London at one line. time, and all of a sudden she just lost it. I mean, she was fine, and then she started screaming and running through the streets, tearing off her clothes, you know, and it was just like no one really knew where it was coming from or what was happening. But, I mean, generally, I always thought Marsha was out of it. I mean, she was out there. She was right. She was not very able to, um, when I knew her, so again, that's like probably starting around 86 or 87, somewhere that I said. You know, she was not very, uh, you know, you couldn't really have a real conversation with her. You know, she was very all over the place and um, you know at times she you'd be able to talk to her and then it would just go into something else and she was just out there she was not really you know you couldn't grab hold you right. know but I think the only time I really saw her lose it was that and it was kind of scary I mean she really people had to run after her and grab a hold of her and you know, and although she appeared very kind of like kooky and funny a lot of the time, I really think that when I, by the time I knew her, she was, you know, lost her, had lost her mind. You know, I don't think, she, you know, there were times she was fine. I mean, she'd show up and it was okay, and then it would just like all disintegrate. And that was the most... But during the period where she was okay, she was able to focus enough to show up for the yeah, I mean, she could never things that you were doing and... Yes, she never could really learn her lines. Right, you know? I've seen that on the page. Yeah, I mean... But she sort of turned her own advantage. Yes, 
See, that's what I'm saying, is that there was something very, you know, that's what she reminded me of Gracie Allen in the sense that, you know, you never knew, is this, is she doing this? Or, like, does she know she's doing this? Or is this, like, just whatever? And I never really could figure that out. Um, well, even as, ba as far back as the early 70s when, um, when Marsha and Sylvia started Star, the Star House, um, Marsha said to Sylvia, I want you to be the president. I'll be the vice president because I guess Sylvia said, you know, Marsha, this is your idea. Um, and Marsha said, I have trouble focusing. I, I, you know, you be the president, I'll be the vice president because I will not be able to focus. And, and, uh, and that's manage. probably when she was focusing better because I don't even imagine her being able to say that much. Right, I think over later. time, yeah, things just seemed Something to really did, you know, because by the time I knew her, I mean, she was, she was kind of a caricature. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, there wasn't really somebody there that you could really talk to. Right. right. You know, but there was a sweetness to her, and you know, always. And um, but I, I, just, I guess for even from what you're saying, it's like earlier on there was like somebody really at home. You know, and by the time that I knew her, yeah. it really. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure once I've spoken to everyone, I'll be able to figure out where along the line when did that the happen? mental um, capacity changed. Because the family knew a person that didn't have that problem as a child. As a child. But um, I also don't know yet you know, what kind of a diagnosis um, Marcia had. Yeah, that know? would be very so, interesting because I'm uh, sure, I mean, I think that you could have been schizophrenic. Because like that breakdown that she had on the street was just out, you know, first of all, by that, related to anything, no, but by that time she, I think, already had AIDS, mm -hmm. and um, I think she had drug, I don't know, I don't know what her drug history is, but I assume that there were drug problems. You know, know, that I haven't really established yet, um, whether or not um, she was using drugs or not, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, because she did, she was on the street a lot, I think, even during that, you know, that you could not always find her, you know, she was like... By choice, um, in at least the later years, when, when you knew Marsha, mm -hmm. uh, from what I know from Randy and from other people who were very close to Marsha, um, by choice in those later years, she was on the street and she was prostituting. Um, earlier, like in the 60s, it was a different story. Right. Um, she was prostituting probably because you know, a character like Marsha in the 1960s what? didn't have a whole lot of other right, options yeah. probably, but, um, but in the late 80s when Marsha was living with Randy and had a stable home atmosphere and all of that, by her choice, she was living right. on the streets and, and doing all of that. Um, but that's an interesting to say, uh, by her choice, because I mean, if you're psychotic, it's, there's, what is your choice? Well, you know? yeah. I mean, because it's a kind of a hard, does anybody really want to be on the street and prostituting? I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's what's interesting about all of that to me, is that it, although it looked kind of fun and, you know, kooky and everybody's going the wrong way, you know, there's a gigantic price as she, which she paid in the biggest way at the end of her life. I mean, you know, which I don't, did you, does anyone know what happened with that? I'm trying to get... The police files now, um, I've read everything that Randy, the roommate, mm -hmm. um, has, uh, I've talked to people, and uh, from what I've looked at so far, I couldn't, I mean, I can see an argument for suicide, I can see the argument for murder, and I can't really, at this Just point, which say, you know, this one looks more plausible, this one right. doesn't. Yeah, it's hard to say, because by that time, by the time we went to London, she was pretty out of it, I mean, she was holding on by, you know, a thread. But I, I have to say that since when I met her, whatever lucidity that had really been there was not really there anymore, you know? Okay, so even in your period of time, yeah, I would not. you I mean, saw the deterioration. I, I can't, yes, I saw a deeper deterioration by the time we went to London. She was, I mean, yeah, I mean, she was sick. Yeah. You know? uh, Marsha had also been on the streets. Um, have been shot and okay. all sorts of things over the years. And I know there's one mention, I think, 
Uh, this is from the early 70s in an interview. She mentions about her fifth husband was murdered on the street. And so there was all sorts of stuff going on over the years that um, I'm sure it took its toll. And her, her family, did they know about all this or did they? Um, I have a feeling she kept a lot from her family. Yes, her family, uh, they live in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Uh, two of them live in another place in New Jersey, but mm -hmm. they're basically in the New York area. A um, couple of sisters, a few brothers. Um, Marcia's name was Malcolm Michaels Jr., which you probably know. Uh, they refer to their brother as Mikey. Um, the, he was openly gay with his parents mm -hmm. and with his brothers and sisters. Um, there was a rule, no women's clothes at home, but at the same time it wasn't that they were saying, you know, we want to reform you or, or any of those right, kinds right, of right. things. Um, the sister, uh, one of the sisters tells a story about when he would come to visit, he would come in drag and uh, tells a story about one of her kids saying, hey, there's my Uncle Mikey, and one of the friends saying, no, it's a woman. And he's like, no, that's my Uncle Mikey. <laughs> so um, probably a lot of the goings on, but um, the family was in perfect agreement when they went to do the obituary in the New York Times. Um, I don't know if you ever saw that obituary. No, I never did. Um, but in the New York Times, when they went to do the obituary for the New York Times, um, they listed, you know, uh, drag performer, stonewall, blah, 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 street prostitute. And um, the family was in complete agreement with having that in the New York Times. Uh, the New York Times wouldn't do that and finally settled with um, Lady of the Night. <laughs> okay, <laughs> they so. should have said too. She, she was all right with it, wasn't it? And the family was fine. So, like, yeah. so the family, you know, they, Knew they were a very, very okay. caring, loving family. Wow. Um, and um, very interested to talk to me. And, uh, That's uh, wild. But uh, I don't know if they were ever at any of the shows. I, I never I, saw them. I never saw them. I think, as far as that was concerned, they were very separate. They, um, yeah. They were I mean, involved. to me, when I knew her, it didn't seem like she really had, she had the attachment with, I didn't even know the name of the person in the Randy, book. But yeah. Yeah, and, and that seemed about it. I didn't see any, you know, family thing at all. Um, Sylvia Rivera was Marsha's friends from the streets in the 1960s. Um, they were at Stonewall together, and they started um, the Star and Star House. Um, then I think, due to Sylvia's personal situation, I think they were together for most of uh, the late 70s to the 80s. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's probably why you wouldn't have yeah. met Sylvia. No, I really can't say that I met any of okay. the people that okay. Marsha and her right. Did she ever talk about Stonewall? Um, no, um, Jimmy. You know, as I said, okay. Jimmy really, in that way, really, I think, saw Marsha as, as kind of a symbol okay. of the beginnings of all of it. And okay. that, you know, Spare and Change for Dying Queen, I think, was written about Marsha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, she wasn't talking too much about anything, really. Yeah, she was just there. And she was there, kind of twiddle, little, you know, just <laughs> really, really not. Uh, how, how did you see the audience's reaction to her performance? Most of it. I mean, she was so endearing in her, in, in, you know, and that people really uh, tended to really love her. Some people could not believe what they were seeing, you know, because it was like. She would just stop in the middle of things, you know, and kind of. But uh, she could crack an audience up just completely. You know? So I think people liked her. I mean, they were kind of, you know, I mean, even with all, and there were a bunch of crazy-looking people up on that stage. She was definitely the top of, the, you know, she was the top of the line in that. Okay. You know. I asked that question because um, when I first went to Sylvia and Randy and said, I want to do her story, you know, I think it should be documented, um, Sylvia said to me, well, we just want to make sure you're not going to make fun of Marsha. Right. And, you know, that never occurred to me. I would, uh, First of all, if I felt that way, why would I waste my time right. writing the story? But um, 
watching the tapes I saw, the crowd seemed to be having a good time and sort of cheering her on. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, but I think people do. Hello? No, they did though. Thing. I would they say did. that that was uh, inaccurate. I mean, you you kind of, as I said, by the time I knew her, this wasn't somebody that you could really. Uh, I don't know. In a way, you couldn't take her seriously because she, I don't think she was taking her so. I don't know. She was. She just wasn't there, you know. Did things seem to bother her? Like, you know, if people were making fun of her, or was she just doing her thing? No, I didn't obvious? seem to bother. But I think they did. This is, I think, I mean, you know, it's, I never really thought too much about what, I know that people were making fun, that that was part of it, and I think that she used that to her advantage, to some extent. But, as I said, she wasn't, um, you know, she wasn't at a place where she was really, uh, it didn't seem to me like she really cared about making a point about anything anymore, you know what I mean? It was like, she was just, she just liked to dress up in drag and, and, have her, and have fun in a way. And at that point, I mean, I, I always, I did see her as a, a sad character by the time that I knew her. And that might not have always been the case, but there was something um, very sad because you could feel that this was somebody that was not present a lot of the time. And again, as I said, I never knew whether it was she was conscious of it or if it was, you know, but I think that it's a very, you know, that I can understand why they said they didn't want people to make fun of me, make sure that it's not, because probably they knew also by that time when I met her, there was, she was a caricature of herself. Whatever it was that she was trying to accomplish earlier on, I think that she had even lost sight of it. Whereas Crisis, who is as big as bigger than life as anybody, you know, you never felt that she. There was a kind of a, some hold on, on a, a sense of her self, you know. And where when I met Marsha, I didn't feel that. I didn't think she was. She didn't have a grasp of her own center anymore. To me, that's what it seemed like. I mean. Um, you know, and and Jimmy was very nervous, pe you know, to take her because she would go off on a, you know. Yeah, and it's interesting to hear that these people that known her earlier, that she really, like, could say something like, you know, I can't focus, or, you know. Right. Because by the time I knew her, she was not saying things like that. Sort of floating, <laughs> yeah, floating around. I, we, we all loved her, and I never made, I never felt that. I felt a sadness, and yet, um, I felt that, uh, like with so many of the drag queens that I met, this wonderful warmth and, and vulnerability that, that was underneath it all. Well, the interesting thing is, is that everybody that I've talked to, and even I've seen a lot of um, videotapes and things, everybody, when you mention Marsha, everybody smiles yeah. and says, oh, Marsha! Um, you know, it's just sort of like a universal feeling when people's first yeah. thought about Marsha is, you know, sort of like a warm, like... Yeah, uh, she was like a vulnerable, kind of, uh, um, very sensitive and very, you know, kind of wounded somewhere, too, you know, and... But she was very funny in her own way, too. I mean, very, very funny. Um, sort of like jokes funny or just a funny sense of humor? Just kind of, of a, as I said, it's like a Gracie Allen type of mm -hmm. thing, just like... You know, and then things would just come out. They were just so hilarious. And it wasn't always, I mean, we didn't, we weren't doing it to make fun of her. We thought it was just, it's kind of an absurdist kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they just come on. Like, even when we went, you know, uh, like to take her home, she really was scared to go on the plane um, yeah. and all that. Right. And, but when she, <laughs> when we got to customs, you know, she was like, it, it was a certain kind of, like very, she, she was really trying to explain to these customs people, you know, that these were her aunt's club, I mean, just making up some insane story in the absurdest 
absurdity of it was hilarious. And it was totally unbelievable to the customers. Oh, yeah. oh, they were like, <laughs> I mean, you know, you've seen pictures of Marsha. You've seen Marsha, right? Have yes, you ever? Yes. So you know that, I mean, and her walking in with these shoes and just, oh my God. <laughs> and she knew better than we do. That's why I think Marsha really was very, very smart. But I think she was, uh, by that time, disconnected from that. But, um, like, she knew that there was going to be problems, and I really didn't think there would be. I was like, come on, what are they, you know, you're, you're, they're not going to bother you. And they did. Yeah. You're no. thinking, you know, no drugs or guns or right, all those I mean, kinds of things that they're looking for, so why would they? I didn't look through it. They spent, like, you know, they were making fun of her. They were making they were fun of her. Yes. Yes. So I, um, I think in a way, like so many people, you know, she got caught up in her own mythology, like, you know, that in a way, something that she had used as a way to get over became, she became a victim of it on some level, you know? Most progressiveness of mental illness. Yeah, I, I would be interested in knowing what it was that really, really uh, yeah. what her illness really was. Yeah, I, um, I, you know, I putting together someone's life like this, especially somebody who lived on the street, very difficult. Yeah. But slowly but surely, I'm finding all these pieces, and um, it's interesting how everybody is so disconnected because. Um, she was involved with how teachers obviously for a long time and, and you as a group. I mean right. obviously you're not together now, but um, there are a number of you and you're out there and uh, Randy and, and Sylvia and other people really knew nothing about how teachers. Really? So they knew nothing because I they knew nothing that she about was that. in it, but th there was no real um, uh, sort of like, oh yeah, you need to talk so and so right, right. or oh they did this and that and it was sort of like a knowledge but uh, and a it's very exactly separate like, world. That's exactly and then, like you're on that other side of the yeah. divide, you, you knew a whole part of her. Um, but during all of this, I, I have seen that she was being treated in a mental health clinic in Hoboken. Um, and she had been institutionalized or hospitalized, I guess is probably a better way to put it, um, numerous times over the years. Um, her sister told me that you know, she would get calls from, from Marcia saying, I'm at the such and such hospital, come and visit me. And uh, that went on off and on for, for many years. Um, but I don't have from anybody any kind of like real clear, well, Marcia was diagnosed with this or that. Right, right. But uh, I think you're right. It's To me, it does sound like um, schizophrenia. Yeah. Okay. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. And of course, uh, hopefully, I can find over time whether it's Marshall was yeah. medication. Uh, I think that when I met her, though, it was definitely at the later stages of all that. I mean. Well, you mentioned AIDS. Um, I have read that Marshall was HIV positive. I don't know whether she was open about that. Um, you happen to remember? I think she, she told me one. Yeah. yeah, I think she did at the end. Like. It's, I think, when did she die? It was, uh, it was in July of 1992. So it really wasn't that. When did we do this thing? I can't remember the date, but... Uh, some of the ones I've seen are like 88. Yeah. But I think well, London was a little later, so maybe... Was it like, later? Okay. So yeah, I'll probably later. maybe like 90. So it was pretty close to the end for her, yeah. And I think um, she told me once that she was HIV or that she had a, I don't remember how she put it, but yeah, she was kind of open about it, I think, at the end. And I think that's a fine, I mean, that's what drove her to the fine, you know, to just, she, because she was, by the time we went to London, she was, she was going, I mean, to her mind, whatever thing that she had held on to was pretty much going. Was that the last time you worked with her, the London? Yes. That was the last time I saw her when we... It was? Yeah. Okay, that yeah. was one of my last questions was, yeah. when was the last time you saw her? Yeah, it was... So I was at Kennedy Airport at the Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was so nervous. It was so much, such a wild... Yeah, I think that was the last time I ever saw her. Yeah. And how did you find out that she had died? I think Jimmy told me. I think Jimmy told me. Yeah. And it was, you know, and... Um, and then someone else who knew that I had a, had some affiliation with the Hot Pages read it or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was a memorial service. Were you at the memorial no. service? I don't know when that was. 
I guess it was around that was five, right so. within a week or two of her death. Yeah, I might have been out of the country or something like that. Because yeah. I have a, I have a, uh, a video tape of that. Wow. Um, it was in a, in a church that's on the corner of 7th Avenue and 13th Street. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, actually quite a beautiful service. And the family talks and friends. Wow. And all sorts of people. And uh, I don't remember if anybody from Hot Teaching was there. They, they probably but were. Yeah, I'm sure they were. Yeah. I mean, I really, you know, think that Marsha, even though I saw her at the later days of her or whatever, I think she was a remarkable uh, person. Um, I guess for just being who she was, you know, just for being it, you know. And there was a kind of charisma to her, mm -hmm. you know. That yeah, I think that's a good word to use because she had an effect on people. Yeah, without, you know, why? Why? This crazy, you know. But there was something that was really, that did. I mean, I, you know, I, she affected me. Of all the people that I remember of the Hot Peaches, it's her and Crisis that had the largest kind of, you know, that stay with me. Um, Did anybody write anything about Crisis? Uh, other articles about... There's a movie, uh, you know, there's a documentary called Split. Split. Yeah, and um, I think you can get it at, you know, one of, uh, what's the, I can never remember them. I know that they show, they, they have copies of it in the some of the more artsy video places. And um, I think the director's name is Ellen Turk. I am actually in that. And, and actually, cry, um, uh, Marsha might even be in that, because it has a lot of stuff of uh, the Hot Peaches, interviews with the Hot Peaches. So, um, and I, somebody really should write something about Crisis, too. I mean, mm -hmm. um, but there is that documentary. Um, Were Marsha and Crisis friends, or did they have any history? I'm sure they had history. I don't know what it was. They kind of inter... They were, you know, I think they, they were both in this one, right? Yeah. yeah. There's the one. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I bet they were they were street pals, you know, because Crisis had spent a lot of years on the street, too. So, um... Sylvia will know if, yeah, if they did. I'm sure that they... they uh, too. <laughs> I, my, my whole idea as far as writing a story is that um, Sylvia Rivera's story has been told in the book Stonewall by Martin Duberman. Mm -hmm. um, and I also saw the movie Stonewall. Yeah, I did see the movie Stonewall. Yes. There's a um, Puerto Rican drag That's queen. That's right. Yeah. That's based on Sylvia. Right. From wow. Okay, so it's based. And Sylvia and Marsha were friends from the early, well, I think the mid-60s. They met on 42nd Street, turning tricks. Um, but my interest is is to show how this person, Marsha, and with her friend Sylvia, you know, mental illness, prostitution, all these things, um, was able to be a major part of gay liberation. Um, try to create a sort of a transgender awareness, um, social services. Um, even though it all fell apart, right. um, later on you have the whole story of Marsha, which she's sort of living on the streets, and she's even in the 80s was involved with the Christopher Street uh, liberation, and then it became Heritage of Pride, um, gay men's health crisis, raising money, um, and Sylvia went off in her own world, which was also the troubles, but. Um, how eventually Sylvia is now living in somewhat of a successor to Star, which is called Transgender House. Um, and it's kind of like their dream of the early 70s got realized almost 20 years later. Right. Um, but uh, Sylvia is now living in Transgender House. It's in Brooklyn and um, it's run by transgender people and uh, it's sort of like it's almost like their own social services agency. They live there and they have counseling and that's uh, great. And so that's that's the side of the story I want to show is right, that more positive. all of what Marsha did and she was this wild character, but there is a very interesting set of accomplishments. Absolutely. Which didn't end with Marsha's death. Uh, and that's and I think that you know I I always thought even when I was thinking about crisis and Marsha throughout the years, you know this whole now this. You know, the kind of the mass media is taking it, you know, uh, allowing a trans 
um, you know, transvestites and stuff to be part of the culture. You know, Wesley Snipes is is. Pl- Do you know what I mean? Well, RuPaul. RuPaul. You know, RuPaul is is now acting, you know, without drag, you know, as sort right. of like an total And I do RuPaul, believe right? that all of those people that, you know, really sacrificed a lot of their their lives to, you know, making that more palpable to every for everybody, you know. They kind of didn't, I always felt like a, pissed off, especially for Crisis, because she was just really getting all of her own emo- stuff together emotionally. And it was like, shit, you know, if she could have lived 10 more years, you know, it was like, she could have, whatever, you know, yeah. because it really did, you know, with RuPaul and, I forget these others that I've seen. Oh, there's really. so many yeah. now. It's like and it's like nothing now. It's yeah. like nothing. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, fine. And they really were at the forefront of that and yeah. made it, you know, yeah. possible for all these other people. Yeah. So I agree with you. I mean... Uh, and, uh, you know, now there probably is more of an ability for somebody who starts to lose it uh, mentally, you know, they would be able to get help in, in, in better ways and, you know, yeah. and stuff like Last that. Last year in an interview in the New York Times, Sylvia, it's interesting, uh, Sylvia mentions uh, one other transgender person and says, well, um, just got back from uh, a psychiatric hospital and Sylvia says, that's common with transgender people we I think she says something like we tend to go insane occasionally <laughs> um, so you know it's sort of like a pattern there which I think people like um, uh, Sylvia and Marsha in the early 70s when they were trying to put this together they were in their own limited way trying to yes. do something about that but and I must say that all throughout the time that I, I had heard that about Marsha's involvement in a lot of this kind of stuff I never really had seen her do it but I knew that you know, that, that she had been involved in it, and, um, you know, and it always seemed kind of like a strange dichotomy, because there was this wild, you know, for her to really be able to... Like, involved in serious causes yeah. and things like that. But yeah. I did know, I mean, I could see that part of her, that there, you know, yeah. I could see that there was a very, you know, somewhere, a very serious being under there. One, one last uh, question is, in one of the videos,